Welcome back to another episode where author and trial lawyer Rick Friedman shares his insights and techniques to having success in the courtroom. This video is episode four of six, which means if you haven't seen the previous episodes, we got to catch you up to speed. So I'll provide links in the description down below. So be sure to check those out. Speaking of which, whenever you do go down in the description, you'll also see links to Rick's books and other resources that are mentioned during this six episode series. Now I want to ask you to do one simple thing. If you find yourself liking this video, then please hit the like button down below. Doing so allows the video to rank higher, reach more people, and ultimately help more people. And that's always the goal. With all that out of the way, let's get back into the interview with Rick Friedman. I hope you enjoy. How are you with objections? My wife was a trial lawyer for 25 years, and mm -hmm. she didn't, you know, she didn't have frequent trials, maybe yeah. one every couple of years. She would always sit and read the evidence rules cover to cover before each trial just to they're not that long yeah. and they're uh and they're not that complicated and the other thing i think is one of the best overviews on um uh irving younger has a set of tapes where he talks about evidence i think mm -hmm. in the old days it was tapes and they lasted uh i think there were like 13 hours or something Nobody taught evidence better. No one has ever taught evidence better than Irving Younger. And he's entertaining as mm -hmm. all get out. So if you, it, it, I would highly recommend listeners get a hold and listen to his lectures on evidence because he has ways of explaining things you'll never forget. But um, here's my thinking about objections. If we put aside what we've learned about in law school, and I think in, in becoming a trial lawyer, I think I have a whole chapter on this or a whole section, you know, mm -hmm. find me a case where a plaintiff lawyer got a defense verdict overturned because an in-trial objection was overruled or sustained. You know, yeah. the, the, the you're not going it, to, it's, you might it's like finding lightning strikes it's there are some i'm sure somewhere but mo these days most evidentiary issues you can see them coming the you know we file motions in limine to keep our stuff out they file motions in limine to keep their stuff out it's all dealt with ahead of time uh so it's it's rare that a big evidentiary issue is going to just show up for the very first time in trial yeah um little evidentiary issues come up all the time and so if if i'm doing so let's take my presentation first i love it when the defense objects i wish they would object more i i because the the main message any juror gets when there's an objection is oh this party doesn't want us to see this evidence, doesn't mm -hmm. want us to hear this. They've got something to hide. So as I'm trying to decide subconsciously, if not consciously, who do I trust here? I'm not going to trust the people who are repeatedly objecting, mm -hmm. period. So I don't, I mean, I've gone through two, three, five week trials without making a single objection. Wow. And I let them lead you know, so what happens when they lead their expert witness? The the jury sees the lawyer is testifying, not the expert. He's leading the expert around by his nose. Yeah. Is that a credible presentation of an expert? I don't think so. So I let them lead. I let them usually ask questions about hearsay. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't care. And and I I so. Oh, I'm, so I've, I've conflated. So when I'm presenting, I love it when they object. I wish they would object more. Um, and uh, do you argue the objection? Well, the judge usually has their, you know, sometimes they want you to come up to the bench. Sometimes yeah. they want you to just say, you know, evidence rule 608, whatever. Yeah. So, but 
Yeah, I will. I will argue to get my evidence in. For okay, sure. I was about to say, yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. And and I love the jury seeing us argue, whether it's yeah. at the bench where they can't hear us. I want them to see. I've got something I want to show you, and this guy doesn't want you to see it. And I'm going to fight to let you see it. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you don't get to see it. We'll move on to the next thing. Yeah. And I I think I. I uh, so yes and then on the other side of the coin i rarely object to what they're doing if there's something bad that i don't think they should be doing i'll file something on that ahead of time it's very rare they just out of the blue start doing something i wasn't expecting that's improper and even yeah. then a lot of times i'll let them do it um because you know we get to choose our cases yeah we're we're right they're wrong Mm -hmm. The more rocks are turned over, the more light that's shined on the case, generally speaking, the better, you know, now there, you know, there can be bad facts that come in, uh, you know, criminal conviction. It's a nice, easy one. You know, my client, the plaintiff has a criminal conviction for burglary. I wish it wasn't there. I file a motion in limine to keep it out. And if I lose that motion, then there's an opportunity there. And that's that's the thing to always keep in mind is there's almost always an opportunity on an evidentiary issue or when you lose an issue, uh, even if it's not evidentiary. So, okay, the judge allows the jury to hear about my client's burglary conviction from eight years ago, mm -hmm. you know? And so maybe an opening, you know, I'll, I'll talk about the things the defendant did wrong, got drunk, ran a red light, whatever, you know. And so you might be thinking, members of the jury, why are we here? Well, we're here because eight years ago, my client had a burglary conviction, served 18 months in jail, never been in any trouble since, has a full-time job, wife and two kids. But the defense is thinking when you hear about his burglary conviction, you'll just turn him away and forget about the drunk driving and the running the red light. And mm -hmm. that's the truth, isn't it? That probably is why we're trying the case. So, so if I, I'll try to keep out the burglary conviction, but if yeah. it comes in and then let's suppose the motion limine is granted, it's kept out. And then the defense lawyer gets it in anyway. Yeah. And then there's all kinds of opportunities there as well um, in terms of curative instructions. And there are times where I, I get a little paranoid about leaving it to the jury. Like, let's just use the motorcycle case just because it's all online. <laughs> sure. Um, there was a witness. I took her deposition and she said that she thought my client was speeding based on how loud the motorcycle was. She, and she took it a step mm -hmm. further. She thought my client was racing based mm -hmm. on, on the speed. So I go through the, through the deposition and ultimately she says, yeah, I'm speculating. I like, you know, I saw him for all of 10 feet and mainly heard yep. it. Um, yep. And I'm not, I'm not an expert in all this. Yeah. So my, but in this case, I was getting hometowns like no other Rick. And so mm -hmm. my fear was, okay, this judge is going to let this in and I'm going to, I'm going to have a cross basically establish the same exact thing that I just did during this deposition. She's not an expert. Is that all? Is that all you need in order to be confident in the jury to understand it? Yeah, she's not an expert to determine that, or or is that something that you'd be paranoid about with just that coming in? Well, it's time to get rid of the paranoia. You know, it's yeah. like uh, we're. I mean, part of what I think is um, somewhat comforting to me is, you know, you did you. Jarrett didn't cause the accident. Mm -hmm. You didn't create this set of facts. You didn't create this witness. The witness says what the witness says. You may win or lose the case. It, yeah. it, it, it's, you know, if you can't accept the fact that you step up to the plate, you might strike out. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and it's, it's because it's not an athletic event. It's, you know, at least in a strikeout situation, it's kind of all on you and the pitcher, you yeah. know, one on one. In a trial, there's so many factors going on. Uh, you know, partly it's it's getting to the point of being able to tolerate the messiness of the human condition. You know, yeah. okay, this witness thought he was speeding. You know, she is speculating, but he was loud. And, you know, it, the jury may get it wrong. 
Mm-hmm. But worrying about it isn't going to change anything. Uh, you know, the is there something I can do? Maybe, maybe not. But yeah. it, if you think of something you can do to make it more persuasive for your side, of course you want to do that. But um, and, you know, and the the paranoid thought is well, I mean, I'll, I'll, if I'm being honest, I yeah. obviously don't want to lose. But right, the course. other aspect of it is. I need the client to understand what's at stake here. Like if this comes in, maybe that does put his case a little bit more at risk. Um, sure. then so maybe you take a slower, say so take a lower settlement off settlement of because of that. Yeah. And, and, sure. you know, obviously putting in the client's hands of like, you know, what's your risk tolerance here. Um, mm-hmm. and so I, I guess when it comes to the settlement side, are you, what are your thoughts on that? Like, is it something where you're comfortable of like, look, a jury's going to hear that here. They're not an expert and, you know, not really consider that. Or do you think just hearing the, the negative side should impact the settlement? I mean, it, it should, everything should impact. Yeah. I mean, you, you should be taking everything into account, but also recognizing this is not, nuclear physics like it's not mm-hmm. like you find the right formula and you've got the right answer it's mm-hmm. it's very very human situation and so you know how does this witness come across is she wild-eyed and crazy looking and slurs mm-hmm. her words or is she you know i don't know an umpire in her spare time and yeah. you know very precise and very credible i mean all that stuff has to go into it. And ultimately there is no right or wrong answer most yeah. of the time to, yeah. to most of the, you know, as I said, in uh, becoming a trial lawyer, our job is to take calculated risks on behalf of the client, mm-hmm. their risks. It means it could go wrong. And there is no formula that will make you feel there. There is no technique case framing technique, uh, cross-examination technique, that will make you feel safe. Yeah. The safety has to come from inside you, your attitude towards yourself and your job in the courtroom. That's the only way to get to a place of feeling safe and comfort. Um, I, lo- I love that. And I'm working on that, especially as I'm working through through the book. So I'm going to tread very lightly here on this, this next question, because I, I really, I'm not trying to get in the weeds on it, and it's a big thing mm-hmm. online, but you you were talking earlier about your style with objections. It was a very opposite approach to the Amber Heard Johnny Depp trial, which was object to anything and everything and it appeared to to be the approach of like if I can stump the other lawyer, then I'm going to somehow get credibility there. Um and it made I mean, there were a lot of trending things there. I mean, he had a the one lawyer who was trending because he objected to his own question on hearsay. That was a, a massive meme. But to really boil what I'm trying to say down, are there are you avoiding objections to throw the other side off, um, or is that potentially something you're putting in your back so, pocket to maybe? Uh, lots of things. Judges primarily hate objections. Yeah. Uh, it does throw the other side off. It throws the judges off. A lot of times, I'll be sitting there. I distinctly remember one time in federal court, the judge kept looking over at me like, why aren't you objecting? Why aren't you objecting? Mm-hmm. And he finally called me up to the bench and said, why are you not objecting? Uh-huh. And I said, I don't see the need to. And he said, well, I do. And he started objecting <laughs> to the defense questions. I mean, that's sort of the ideal situation. Of yeah, course. that is but, ideal. <laughs> but, but this, I, I just want to say over and over again, there's not much gain for a plaintiff lawyer objecting period Mm -hmm. it's fun if you know the evidence rules it's you know if you're near a certain type of person it can be fun it can get rid of your stress it's like driving down the road and somebody cuts in front of you and you yell at them you Mm -hmm. may you know maybe you feel better for yelling at them when they cut in front of you has no real effect on anything yeah except in a courtroom your objections just saying i'm getting you know why don't you put a sign up on your forehead that says I'm getting hurt right now by the evidence being presented. Watch everybody. Watch how bad this is. Yeah, I, it, it's if if uh, I, I I do object sometimes, but it's usually to make fun of the defense. Like if yeah. they've been objecting on BS grounds of you know lack of you know leading you know 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you you went the you know, Mr. Expert, you then went to such and such medical college, objection leading. If they've mm -hmm. been playing those games, mm -hmm. I may do it with a smile on my face just to like make fun of them and let get the mm -hmm. jury laughing at them. Yeah. But in terms of serious objections, um once in a while, like I'll I'll object if they're berating my client or not. Yeah. So I'll object if they're not letting my witness answer. Or if it's gotten so bad. So I, I think, never really thought about this before, but if it looks like the other side is being really unfair and rude to a witness, mm -hmm. I will intercede after a while when the jury's good, when I'm pretty sure the jury's good and sick of them doing it. Yeah. I will object then because I want to be the voice of decency in the courtroom. I don't want them to think I'm afraid of objecting. Yeah. But I will tell you again, you know, uh, I go through weeks of trial without objecting often, you know, not uncommon to finish a three week trial. And I've objected two or three times in the whole trial. There are different set of rules for defendants. And and, you know, a defense lawyer can object all the time mm -hmm. and it's not going to hurt their case in the same way. That if we're objecting all the time, it, it, it's just a different set of rules, a different set of rules of engagement. And so um, I think it does generally hurt the defense to be objecting a lot, but it's not as fatal to them as it is to us to be objecting a lot. That makes sense. Um, let, let's transition to my favorite part, which is mindset philosophies of being a successful trial lawyer. I am firmly convinced that virtually everyone who wants to be a trial lawyer has certain hidden gifts that they can bring to the courtroom. But the reason those gifts are hidden is because they're so they're working so hard to present this, you know, their idealized version of themselves in the courtroom. 